Okay, welcome. Welcome to the Functional Programming Toolkit. Uh, this is a talk for kind of beginner to intermediate people interested in functional programming. And you've done a little bit, but there's a lot of things you don't understand, like monads, for example, or functors and all this jargon. So the, the point of this talk is really to go through that jargon and hopefully explain it to you in a way that sort of demystifies it. So it's useful if you've done a little bit of functional programming before, but even if you haven't, I think you'll probably be able to understand most of what I'm talking about because I use lots of little pictures. So um, my name is Scott Voloshin, <coughs> and I have a website, F Sharp for Fun and Profit. Uh, the code examples in this talk will be in F Sharp, but uh, it's not, not a lot of code in this talk, and so don't worry about it if you don't understand the code. So the main question to start with is, why do functional programmers use so many strange words? And it, it comes across as very scary to most people. There's words like functor, catamorphism, applicative, currying, monoid, and monad, the most scary word of all. <clears throat> and I, I think the problem is these words kind of sound scary, but they're not actually scary concepts if you understood what they were. I mean, you might be like Homer here and, and think, I can't possibly understand any of this stuff. It's way too complicated. But it's not, I don't think it's scary. I think it's unfamiliar. So if you knew what the words meant, or at least were demystified a bit, then um, you might be like Homer here, and you might say, OK, you're mappable. If I called it a mappable, I could understand that, or a collapsible, or an aggregatable. Whatever the word is, it doesn't really matter what the words are, but these words don't sound as scary as the sort of mathematical words. So that's really the goal of this talk, is to demystify. You may not know what they mean. They still be unfamiliar, but at least they're not scary. You know what's really scary is object-oriented programming. And it, 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 just because you're used to it, you don't think it's scary. But if I'm a brand new object-oriented programmer, there's all these words like polymorphism, inheritance, and generics, and covariance, and solid. And solid is five other things. And there's IOC, and DI, and ABC, and everything. You know, you just don't realize how scary it is if you're an experienced RO person. So don't ever say that functional programming uses scary words, because RO is just as bad. It's jargon, right? We're just used to, used to it. OK, so <clears throat> there's four particular words that I'm going to talk about in this talk. And like I say, these are mathematical words. And you might think, well, this is kind of an academic, abstract, theoretical kind of thing. But it actually turns out these are very useful tools. Uh, and again, if you demystified it, hopefully you'll see by the end of this talk they are actually useful tools. So there's something called what I call the functional toolbox, and it's the analogous with a, a, a real toolbox. And um, oops, hold on a second. Um, in a real toolbox, you have all these different tools that you know, and each tool does one particular thing well. And you know, if you're an experienced person, you know which tool to use for which thing. And a functional programmer has a bunch of tools too. Uh, you know, map, return, bind, whatever. All these tools have names, and if you're an experienced person, um, you know you know which tool to use in which situation. And basically, it's about 11 kind of important tools you need to know about. And there's maybe you know 10 other ones which are not quite as important. But if you know these, how to use these 11 tools, you can pretty much do everything in functional programming. So. This is a problem-solving toolbox. It's not an academic toolbox. It's for really getting your hands dirty. So what are the kinds of problems that functional programs need to solve? Well, the first problem they need to solve is, is composition, because everything in functional programming is composition. It's the kind of fundamental principle that I'll talk about in a second. How do you combine things? How do you aggregate things? That's a common problem in both OO and functional. How do you iterate through things? Um, how do you work with effects? Now, this is a kind of more of a functional programming thing. They like Functional programmers talk about effects all the time. And, and what do we mean by effects? And I'll explain what we mean by effects. But these effects are kind of tricky to work with sometimes. And so you have to mix things which are effects and non-effects, or you might need to chain them, or you don't need to work them in parallel. So there's all different things you need to work with when you have effects. And uh, there's a bunch of tools just for those purposes. <coughs> so, these are the kind of words that you'll see a lot. Composition uses the compose keyword. Iteration is generally called fold in functional people. Combine and reduce. Um, map and return. Bind, which is also called flat map. Apply and zip. Uh, sequence, reverse. These are the kinds of names of functions or names of the tools uh, that you will use a lot if you're doing functional programming. 
And of course, if you enter the, the jargon, these things have fancy names. So a combination is generally called a monoid. When you work with different kinds of effects, let's use a functor. If you want a chain effects, that's a monad. If you want to work in parallel, that's an applicative. So don't worry about this. I'm going to explain, hopefully by the end of the talk, all these things. Hopefully they make sense. And even if they don't make sense, they're a little bit less mysterious. That's the whole point. So this talk is, got, is going to be one of those things, like those tourist buses, um, where you go around the city and you'd like stop for one minute in each famous place. Uh, you don't really get a chance to look around, but at least you actually see the sights. Uh, so that's what this is. It's a whirlwind tour of the sites. Uh, you can't possibly understand everything, you know, in one talk. But hopefully if you demystify it and you go away, you know, you can say, oh, I can, I can at least not be scared. I can go in and learn more about it later on uh, when I get a chance. So, <clears throat> start with some principles of, of statically typed functional programming for people who are newbies. Um, the first thing is that functions are things and like, I luckily use a little railway track analogy, and the composition is used everywhere. So there's no inheritance, there's nothing else. It's, everything is composition, and if you know how to use Lego, you know how to do composition, because it's exactly the same. So let's look at functions as things. So a function is a little thing, I, I like to use the railway track analogy, and there's a little tunnel, tunnel transformation. Something goes in and something comes out. Uh, in this case, an apple goes in and it turns into banana. So this is a, uh, we call this an apple to banana function. Right? It, tr it transforms apples into bananas. And the thing about functions is they are standalone things. They're not attached to any class. Um, because they're things, they can be used just like you might use an integer or a string or something. You can pass them around as parameters. You can put them in lists. You, know, you can do all sorts of things because they're just things, just like everything else. And this standalone thing is really, really important because standalone is another word for reusable. If it's, if it's on its own, it can be reused in any context. If it's part of a class, it's really hard to sort of extract it from that class and reuse it in a different context. But all the functions in functional programming are standalone functions. So here's an example of a function that has a normal input, uh, but it has an output, which is a function. Uh, here's an example of a function that has an, a function as an input and a normal output. Here's a function with a normal input and a normal output, uh, but it's got this extra function which can be used as sort of parameterizing it. Uh, and this would be called the strategy pattern in OO. So this is, that's it. That's really everything you need to know about functional programming right there. If you understand that, you understand everything. You can see it can get really complex. It's a, it's a very simple foundation, but you can have functions that return other functions that generate other functions which are used as parameters to other functions. It can get very complicated, but the fundamental principles are basically just what I said in the last few minutes. And most of the tools in the functional toolbox that I'm going to be talking about are function transformers. They take functions in and they spit other functions out. So having functions come in and functions come out, that's a really, really common thing in functional programming. So the next principle, which is really important, is composition. So I'm going to talk about Lego for a second because everyone understands how Lego works, hopefully. And Lego actually has a sort of philosophy, right? Which is that everything is designed to be connected to everything else, right? You don't have Lego pieces which don't fit to other Lego pieces. And if you connect two Lego pieces together, you get another piece which can still be connected to other pieces, right? You never, have, you never run into a wall where, oh, no, I can no longer add any more Lego pieces because I've run out of dots or something, you know? And they're reusable. So here's some Lego. Every single piece in Lego has little dots, so they're designed to be connected. And when you start assembling them, you know, you, don't, you can just keep adding and adding pieces. Um, you know, they're designed to be that way, that you never sort of hit a boundary. You can add two pieces and that makes another piece, you add more pieces. Um, you don't need a special adapter. You don't say, well, this piece won't fit with this piece because then I need a special sort of adapter pattern to make two bits of Lego fit. No, you don't have an adapter pattern in Lego. Right? They just literally connect straight together. And you can keep adding and adding and adding. And you can make really, really big things out of Lego, out of other small pieces. And here's the reusability thing, right? You can, you can make something, and then you can disassemble it and make something else. The pieces themselves um, do not have any strings attached. Literally, they don't have any strings attached. If they had strings attached, they would get tangled up. The strings would get tangled up. And this is one of the goals of functional programming, is that all the functions that you build don't have any strings attached. And that, because of that, they're reusable. They're not attached to a particular context. 
they don't, you don't have to kind of extract them in order to reuse them. They literally are designed to be reusable from the very beginning. So you can make really big things <laughs> from small things in Lego. That's what I like to call the power of composition. Now let's look at the functional programming philosophy, which is very similar to the Lego philosophy. And this is, by the way, I'm talking about statically typed functional programming. The dynamically typed, dynamic functional programming is similar, but there's a little bit of difference. So in functional programming, you try to design functions that do one thing well, the solid principles applied to functional programming too. Um, but the functions can be reused. So you design your functions to be reusable. And you design them to work together. And you expect the output of every function might be the input to some other function. You know, you design them so that you might be working with pieces that you don't even know about yet. And by the way, if you're familiar with the Unix philosophy, this is exactly the same as the Unix, you know, you know utility philosophy, right? And in statically typed functioning pro functional programming, we use the types to ensure that the inputs match the outputs. We make sure that you can't accidentally put the wrong kind of thing together. So this is the, the functional tool, designing things that do one thing well. The toolkit is a very generic set of functions that you use you know, as your kind of building blocks. So let's look at function composition. Here's, a, here's a, an apple to banana function, and here's a banana to cherry function. And how do you glue them together? How do you compose them? How do you, make, how do you connect them? Well, it's really obvious if they're railway track. You just literally stick the two pieces together, and you get any function. And what's cool about this is that you can't tell that this was built from smaller functions, right? So you now have another function that you can then use to build a bigger function, and so on and so forth. And also what's cool is the banana has disappeared. Where did the banana go? You know, you've now got some data hiding, you've got some abstraction. The fact that the, the thing was built from small pieces which use something, the bigger function can hide all that. So, you've, you know, you've got this kind of nice API. And you can build really big things just using functions without any classes or objects or anything. So if you think about a, 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 web, a website, a website is a function. There's a, an HTTP request comes in, and it spits out an HTTP response. The whole thing is a giant function. It's with an input and output. And when you do a, function, a functional design, inside your, your main web function, you have all these little, little functions that do all the little work, and they're all connected together by pipes. Um, you don't need classes. You can, you can seriously build quite sophisticated applications using purely functions. And if you want to call these microservices, be my guest. <coughs> very, microservices are very similar. That's another example of the power of composition. So I have a whole talk on this, if you're interested, uh, on my website. Right, so let's look at number one tool. Number one tool is monoids. Okay or tool number one, that's not, not the number one tool, it's the first tool that I'm gonna be talking about. And there's gonna be some mathematics here, so I hope this won't put you off, okay? If, you've, if you're scared of mathematics, then let's see. So this is the first piece of mathematics. And this is the second piece of mathematics. Uh, and this is the third piece of mathematics. So this is all the mathematics I'm gonna use. So if you can understand this, you will right. Um, so what's interesting is that mathematicians are a little bit like programmers, and they always like to make things abstract. They're always looking for patterns. So a mathematician would look at this and say, hmm, well, this is interesting. I can see a pattern. I can see some patterns here. And let's look at this pattern. Um, we've got some things, and we've got some way of combining them, and the result is another of the same kind of thing. You add two integers, you get another integer back. I wonder if that works for anything else. Oh yeah, it works for multiplication too. If I, add, if I multiply two things, I get another thing back, another integer back. What else does it work for? Well, it works for strings. If I have two strings and I concatenate them, I get another string back. And if I have two lists and I concatenate them, I get another list back. So this is actually quite a common pattern. It happens all over, all over the place. Okay, what's interesting about this pattern is because when you add two things together, in this case, you add two integers, you get another integer. You can keep going. So I can add three to that, and that gives me back another integer. Right? And so I can add four to that. So I can keep adding and adding and adding, just like the Lego. So the Lego analogy is quite good. So what we, we started off with a pairwise operation, like addition or multiplication or you know, adding strings together. And we now have an operation that works on lists. 
we can actually extend it infinitely, adding more and more things without ever running out. Oh, wait, what about the next one? If you, now, this is 1 plus 2 plus 3 is the same as 1 plus 2 plus 3. Okay. Um, what that means is that the order of combining the things doesn't matter. If you combine 2 plus 3 first or you combine 1 plus 2 first, it doesn't make any difference. So you could do 1 plus 2 and then you could add 3 and then you could add 4 or you could do 1 plus 2 here and 3 plus 4 here and then add them later on. It really doesn't matter, matter which way you do it. You always get the same answer. So that's good. Now, it's not always true. Like subtraction, it doesn't work with. Uh, the order does matter for subtraction. So subtraction doesn't fit this pattern. Okay, what about this zero thing? Okay, this is, what does this zero mean? So a mathematician would say, well, this is very interesting. We have this very special kind of thing that when you use it to combine, you know, you combine it with this other thing, you always get back the original thing. Like the zero leaves it alone. It, it, it kind of doesn't do anything. It's, it's a kind of a null pattern. And it turns out that zero is quite a common thing. So when you have multiplication, there's a special thing that when you multiply, you get the same thing back, and that would be the number one. And if you have strings, there's a special thing that when you add it to any other string, you get the same string back, and that's the empty string, and so on and so forth, the empty list. Uh, there's a zero, a conceptual zero, for all these kinds of things. It's very, very common. Right, so here's, here's the pattern that we've recognized. We've got a bunch of things. We've got some way of combining them two at a time. And that's um, the first rule we have is the closure rule, that when you combine them, you get another thing of the same type. And the second rule is associativity, which is when you combine them more than one thing, it doesn't really matter which order you combine them in. And the third thing is there's a zero or an identity element um, that when you combine it with a thing, you get the same thing back. So it like doesn't do anything. So these are kind of, you know, these patterns are pretty kind of obvious patterns if you start thinking about it. And the mathematicians have a word for this thing. They call it a monoid. So here's the mathematical jargon for something which, if you, if you just look at it from pattern analysis, it's like, yeah, this is kind of quite a common pattern that I would recognize. So let's stop with the jargon. Homer says, no more jargon. Don't talk about monoids. Why is, why is doing kind of analyzing these pattern, why is it useful? Like, why, what's, what, how is it useful as a programmer? Well, if you think about the, the closure rule, the fact that you can combine two things and get another thing, that means that all pairwise operations can be converted into things that work on lists. Pair, so you just start with a pair and you add up the list. And this is normally called reduce. So if you have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, you have the plus pairwise operation, and you can take a list of integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and reduce it using plus. So the reduce operation, all it does is basically take the list of items and stick that pairwise operation in between every single one. Uh, if you have a multiplication, reduce is a very common pattern. It's one of the things in our functional toolbox. If you have a multiplication, that's the pairwise operation. We can then take a list of numbers and we can reduce it using multiplication. Right? And we can take a list of strings, do the same thing. Rather than adding them up pairwise, we can collapse an entire uh, list of strings into a single string using the string concatenation operator, and so on and so forth for lists. Right? So this is a really, really common pattern. Now the associativity, the benefit of associativity, there's all sorts of things, divide and conquer, parallelization, incremental accumulation. And I'll talk about uh, parallelization right now. So parallelization means that you can take a bunch of stuff and you can spread it out over multiple CPUs or multiple machines or whatever. So let's say we have to add up one and two and three and four. Um, we could parallelize it and say, we'll do one plus two on this machine and we'll do three plus four on this machine and then we'll take the results and we'll add them together. Now obviously, you wouldn't do that with four numbers, it's ridiculous, but if you have a million or 10 million things to do and these, are, these pairwise operations are quite complicated, um, then this is great. So if you have a monoid, you, you can instantly parallelize it. Now, it, it turns out we don't normally, most of us don't have to worry about parallelization, but another really useful thing is incremental accumulation, which is much more common. So let's say that your boss asks you to add up one plus two plus three, uh, because your boss, your boss is no good at, at mathematics. And she's okay, and then the next day, your boss says, actually, I've changed my mind. Can you add up 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 today? And then you say, well, oh, I have to start all over again. You know, I just had it, and now I have to go all the way back to the beginning and add up 1 and 2 and 3. No, you don't, of course. You can keep the number that you calculated yesterday, 
and just add four to it. You don't have to add the whole thing up from the very beginning because of this associativity. I've already calculated one and two and three, which is six, and all I have to do is add four to it. So I don't have to start from scratch. I can incrementally accumulate. So every time you have a monoid, you can incrementally accumulate data. And finally, we have all these issues we run into. How do I reduce when the list is empty? How do I do a divide and conquer when one of the steps is empty? How do I do incremental accumulation uh, when I don't have any starting data? And that's what the identity element is really good for. It's the initial value for empty data or missing data. So you have these three things, and you can, and you can once you see this pattern, you start seeing it everywhere. And you can have uh, a missing zero. You can have patterns where there's no zero. And the mathematicians call that a semi-group, which is even more obscure. So let's look at a real example. Let's say we have to do some aggregation. Let's say we have a bunch of order lines, and we have to add them up and, and find out the total. Now, we could write a loop and, and write a specialized piece of code to add them up. Um, the problem with that, again, is if I've, again, with three or four things, it's not a problem. But if I have a million things, and then tomorrow I have a million and first thing, uh, I have to start, I have to run the whole loop all over again? No. So let's use the monoid idea, because that gives us the best of all, all, all possibilities. So rather than trying to write a loop, what I'm going to do is say, well, you know, integers are monoids, floats are monoids, any combination of a monoid is another monoid. So order line is a monoid. And all I have to do is write a pairwise combiner where I just add the two pieces and return the new thing. So I have a pairwise combiner, which is normally pretty straightforward to write. And then once I've got the pairwise combiner, I can run it on the entire list, just reduce the entire list using the pairwise combiner. So there you go, that's, there's, re, there's, there's a pattern that would be useful. And like I say, if I have another order line come in tomorrow, I don't have to recalculate the entire total from scratch. I can just add this extra one by using the incremental accumulation principle. Profit. Now, a lot of situations, you don't have monoids. So for example, I have a bunch of customers, and I want to find out how, you know, let's say I keep track of how many times they visit my website, how much money they spend, whatever. I'd like to add all that stuff up, but I can't because customers are not monoids. However, I could create a special kind of class or a structure called customer statistics, which is just integers and stuff, and that would be a monoid because it's all kind of numbers. So what they typically do is you take something which isn't a monoid and you turn it into something which is a monoid, and once you've got it as a monoid, you can then reduce it down. So turning something which isn't in a monoid into a monoid, that's map, and then collapsing the whole thing down into a single value is reduce, and you've probably heard of MapReduce, the MapReduce algorithm. So that's why it's called MapReduce. It's something to do with monoids. So here is a, a nice tweet I saw a long, long time ago. Hadoop make me a sandwich. So Hadoop is a, is a just, you know, it does parallel uh, computation. And you start off, let's say you start off with some bread and some lettuce and whatever, uh, an onion or whatever. You can't just mush them together and make a sandwich, right? They're not, they're not composable. They're not monoids. But if I slice the loaf and I slice the onion and I slice the lettuce, the, the slices can be composed into sandwiches. So, you know, you can then reduce the, the slices into, a, into a, a section of sandwiches. So this is mapping followed by reduce as a way of, you know, making sandwiches, so it's kind of fun. Right, <clears throat> here's the problem with monoids, is once you recognize this pattern, you start seeing it everywhere. Um, for example, if you do DevOps or something and you need to keep track of metrics, there's a little rule saying use counters rather than rates. Uh, and if you say, if you're into monoids, you say just make sure your metrics are monoids because you can do incremental updates and you can handle missing data and so on and so forth. And in fact, m many, many design patterns are actually monoids behind the scenes. Uh, Mark Seaman just wrote a blog post the other day about this. Um, things like the composite pattern is a monoid. The null object pattern is a monoid. Composing commands together to make a new command is a monoid. And if you're into DDD, uh, in the DDD book, it talks about closure of operations. That's a monoid. So you really start, you know, it really kind of ruins you, actually. Now, you say, well, why use the word monoid? It's a jargony word. But just like any piece of jargon, once you know what it means, it's a, it's a shortcut to explaining something quite complicated. So if I say to somebody else and I say, this is a monoid, 
and they know what that means, assuming they know what that means, they will instantly know that they can parallelize it, that they can do incremental stuff, that it has a zero element, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, so it's a, it's a great shortcut for explaining, you know, com complicated. And they also know what patterns to use, how to work with them straight away. What about function composition? Is that a monoid? So here's an app, you know, here's our two functions, and we compose them together, and we make this apple to cherry function. Um, it's not the same kind of thing. The apple, the, you know, one thing is an apple to banana function, the other is an apple to cherry function. So composing functions together is not really a monoid, unfortunately. But if we have functions that turn apples into apples, and we combine them, we get another function which turns apples into apples, and that is a monoid, because it's exactly the, the, the input functions and the output functions are the same kind of thing. So if you're working with functions that turn integers into integers or strings into strings, um, that, those kinds of things you can actually do them incrementally, you can do them, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff because they're monoids. Right, so that's everything you need to know about monoids. A set of values, a combining function, and it has all sorts of different words. I mean, this is why I say it's a pattern that you can recognize because the actual word that you use for the combining function could be anything. So for strings or lists, it's, it's normally called concat. For an integers, it's called plus. Um, in Haskell, it's the angle bracket sometimes, and sometimes you see a pl you know, little plus. All sorts of weird symbols and things, but it's the same concept everywhere. And this co combination, the combiner has to be closed, associated with zero value. So here you go, you can use it for reducing a list, you can use it to do parallel computation, you can use it for doing incremental calculations, all this stuff. So there you go, that's a monoid. So that's uh, tool number one. Hopefully monoids are not quite as scary now. All right, it's demystified a little bit, I hope. Um, and now we're gonna go even more scary, we're gonna talk about effects. So what is an effect? Functional programmers talk about effects all the time. So effect is really just a generic type like a list, a list of something. Uh, or it could be a type with some extra data in it, like an option type or a result type. It could be a type that changes the state of the world, like an async, or it interacts with the world, you know, a task, a random number generators. Or it could carry state around, like a, a state type or a cars or type. It could be all sorts of things. It's actually kind of vague what an effect is. It really could be all sorts of stuff. It's basically, you know, really just a generic type that has some, you know, generic type is, is, is a normal type with some extra stuff, right? So I'm gonna focus on three types in this talk to use them as examples, list, an option, and async. So hopefully everyone knows what a list is. Uh, the option type, if you're using Java, it's now not, there's an optional stuff built in. Hopefully it's, most people are familiar with the optional type of some kind. And the async type, is, it, you can think of it as like the task type. It's kind of similar, F sharp uses async and, and C sharp uses task. So, this whole thing of effects, there's like normal world and effects world, okay? So in normal world, you have strings and you have integers and you have booleans, and you have functions that turn strings into uh, ints into strings, you have functions that turn ints into bool. So this is like your normal world, the normal everyday objects. Now what's interesting is for every kind of effect type, like options and lists and whatever, there's a parallel world. It's like a mirror world. And everything in this world is options, for example. So instead of having strings, you have optional strings. And instead of having ints, you have optional ints and optional bools. And every function that turns a, an int into a string, in optional worlds, that function turns optional ints into optional strings. Uh, or it turns optional ints into optional bools. Right? So it's like a parallel universe. Um, and same thing with list worlds. In list worlds, everything is lists of things. There's lists of strings and lists of ints and lists of booleans. And all the functions turn lists into lists. Well, you know. So this is my little analogy for these worlds. And it's going to be quite an important concept. We're going to be talking about these worlds quite a lot. And async is another world. Everything, you can see how it's going, right? You can see the pattern here. And so there's this sort of generic effect. No matter what effect it is, there's some sort of E. I'm going to call E for a generic effect. Uh, and there's generic effect types and there's a, a generic effect functions. Okay, so that's my effects world. So that's, the, that's everything you need to know about effects. Just remember, every time you hear someone talk about effects, you can probably replace it with option or list or async or whatever. 
So here's, here's our first problem, is how do we work with these effects? We need to do stuff in effects world sometimes. Uh, and how do we do that? And I'll give you uh, some concrete examples. So let's say here's the world of normal values and here's the world of options. And sometimes we have a function that takes us from the, world, from the normal world into optional world. And then we need to work with the data in the option. So we then basically extract that data and we do something with it and then somehow it goes back up into optional world again. And then we extract the data again and it goes back into optional world. This back and forth between worlds is um, a really common pattern, but it's actually a really bad pattern. So like, don't do this, all right? Functional programmers would, would call this a kind of design smell or a code smell. <clears throat> so like, well, you know, how, how do you solve that, right? What you really want to do is when you go into the effects world, whatever it is, you want to stay there. You want to keep working up there and only come down at the very end if you have to. Uh, I mean, a good example in C Sharp is the task or the async await. Once you've made something async, or you turn it into, you, you're basically stuck. You're let, you, you have to, everything else has to work in that world, in the async world or the task world. And you only ever come down at the, at the very top of your program. You don't, you know, it's bad, bad practice to like wait for a task to finish and then start another task and then wait for the side. What you want to do is lift everything up into this async world and work up there. Uh, and then at the very end of your program, which is your controller or whatever it is, that's where you actually deal with the async or the task. So that's the right way to do it. So let's say we have an add 42 function, very important function. Uh, and if we run it on a normal thing like one, um, we get the answer 43. If we run it on a, on a thing which is an option world, like someone, uh, it doesn't work. It only works on normal things. It doesn't work on options. So this add 42 function is useless as the, the way it stands. So we'll say, okay, well, let's write our own custom add 42 to option function. So we'll say, well, if the option is something, if it's valid, then we're going to you know, run the add 42. And then we have to wrap it back up into option world again. Uh, and if it was never something, then we're done. We don't have to do anything. So we're, we're unwrapping it. We're doing the thing that we need to do, and then wrapping it back up again. And that's, like I say, that's a bad way to do it. You're going down. You're doing something. You can come back up. This is an anti-pattern. So what you, instead you want to do is you want to somehow be able to work with this add 42 function up in the effects world, in the option world. So we want to stay up there. So how do we, how do we, how do we make an add 42 function up there without having to write all the special code every single time? And that's what map does. So this map is a, is a function transformer that moves functions from one world to another world. So if we have a, a function down here that turns t's into u's, if we do option map, it turns options of t's into options of u's. That's what option map does. So in our code, instead of, uh, you know, we've got our normal function, we can say option map of add 42, and that gives us our add 42 to option. So now we have a, the add 42 now works in the world of options, and we can run it straight away. Um, so we now have a function in the option where we didn't have to write any special code to wrap it and unwrap it, it, get, it just happens for free. And typically, we don't actually write a special, we don't give it a special name, we literally inline it like this. The option map of, you know, of this, and we can apply it to the other thing. Same thing with list world. Uh, let's say we want to add 42 to each integer, each item in the list. So, you know, for each item in the list, uh, we add 42, and then we put it back in the list again, and return the new list, say. Um, but we're doing this thing. When you're doing an iteration, you're basically unwrapping things out of the list. You're pulling out each element out one at a time, applying the thing, and then putting them back in the list again. Um, so again, this has been anti-pattern. You don't want to come down, do the thing, and go back up. Don't do that. Again, we can, instead we use list map. So it takes a normal function down in normal world, you run list map, and it gives you a function up in list world. So if I want to define the add 42 to each function, all I have to say is list map of the add 42 function. Now I have a function that works on lists, and I didn't have to write any special code. So that's kind of cool. So you can see that uh, this map is really, really useful. And people say, well, I can always write my own loops. Why is this any easier uh, than writing my own loops? And the answer is that, again, if you, if, once you know what list map does, first of all, it's easy for you to use because you don't have to write any code. 
Secondly, it's also easier for someone else to understand. Assuming they understand how, how it works, they can look at your code and they know exactly what's going on. Sometimes if you look at a complicated loop, you're trying to figure out what's actually going on in this loop, you know, because it's not, the loop logic kind of gets in the way of the actual thing that you're trying to do. Um, if you use things like this map, the loop logic is kind of hidden. So you can really focus on what, what's actually being transformed, what's actually going on. In this case, it's really obvious that we're adding 42 to each item. Now, if I had a, if I had a loop and there was like 42 in there, it would take me some time to figure it out. So I actually think this is better. Once you understand what this map does, this is actually easier. And of course, async, same thing. We have a, a normal function and we can map it into the world of async. And that way we can kind of chain async function together. So most generic types have a map, list and async, and so we use them. And if you write your own generic type that you're going to put out in a library, you make your own map, and then everyone else can use it. And of course, now we have the jargon version of map. So the jargon version is it's a functor. So a functor is an effect type, which again is option or async or list or whatever it is, plus some sort of map function that works with it, that's specifically designed. So, you know, the, the definition, the implementation of map for options is different from the implementation of map for lists, which is different from the implementation of map for uh, tasks or async or whatever. But the, the concept is the same. So I can use you know, a list map or whatever. Once I know that this thing exists, I know exactly how to use it. Um, the map function has all sorts of different uh, names. Sometimes it's called select, sometimes it's called lift. Um, sometimes it's called fmap. So um, it needs to have a sensible implementation. Um, it turns out there's a bunch of things called the functor laws, which is really just a fancy name for some rules that implementation should have to make sure that they work sensibly. Like you can't, you shouldn't do anything, something too stupid. And the functor laws are just basically a way of making sure that your implementation makes sense. So that's number two. What about number three? Well, this is a really simple one. This is just sometimes, you know, we, we just talked about moving functions from one world to another. Let's talk about moving individual values like integers or strings. And that's called return. So here are a word of normal values, uh, and we want to make a, a, an optional int. We just use return. Like here, here's, an, here's a normal value, and we make an optional int. We're wrapping it in some. Similarly with lists, if we have a, a single integer, and we want to make a list out of it, we use list return, and that makes a list of ints. So here you have 42, and we make a list out of it. You know, just in this case, it's really easy. It's just a single item in a list. So again, it's not normally called return. I mean, the actual way of making these things, the name is all sorts of, it's all different in different environments, but the concept is you're just moving things from one world to another. Value in normal world, value in this world. So you bear with me, you're probably thinking, all these things, are they actually you know, useful? And at the very end of the talk, I'm actually going to show you how to assemble it all in a real piece of code, um, using all the different tools together. As, uh, and so just think about how, how, you know, how these tools can work together to, to build complex programs. Now, this is the most important tool, probably, in the functional toolbox, which is bind. Uh, and it's, 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 it's used for world-crossing functions. Okay, what, the, what the, is a world-crossing function? Okay, I'm, I'm introducing all these kind of concepts. But they're not, they're not um, particularly difficult to understand, I don't think. It's just something different that you're not used to if you, you're not a functional programmer. So here's a function called range. And you give it a maximum number, and it will give you a list of all the numbers up to that number. So if you give it the, you know, the maximum of 100, it will give you all the numbers from 1 to 100. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, if you look at the, what it does, you pass in an int, and you get back a list of ints, right? So you have a value in normal world, and the output is a value in list world. This is really, really common. So if you think about it like this, you start off an int down here, and you end up with a list of ints up here. And this is range. Now, here's another more complicated example. Let's say you're getting a customer from a database. Uh, you pass in the customer ID. Uh, if the customer is found, then you can say, yeah, I found some customer data and I'm going to give it back to you. Um, if I didn't find the customer, I say, okay, I won't give you back anything. Um, and again, if you look at the inputs and outputs for the function, it says, well, you give me a customer ID, which is a normal thing, and I'll give you an optional 
piece of customer data. So the, the input is in normal world, but the output is in option world. So again, this is a world crossing function. It starts down at the bottom and it ends up at the top. And these functions are really, really, really common in functional programming. So in this case, it's the get customer function. <clears throat> so th this is like really, 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 really common problem. And how do you chain these things together? So here's some code. It's just a, a kind of silly little example. You, have, you do something and you get back an X. And let's say that do something is a world crossing function. It returns an option, say. Well, I can't really do anything with the X unless I know whether it's valid or not. So I have to say, is it something? If it's something, let me go on. And then I do something with that. And that, maybe that gives me another something. And I have to say, well, I have to check that as well. And maybe then I, only when it's valid can I do the next thing. And I have to check that as well. And only when it's valid can I get the next thing and so on. Now, you could replace this with null checking. You've probably seen the same kind of code. If it's not null, do the next thing. If that's not null, do the next thing. And if that's not null, do the next thing. So this is just the, the option version, exactly the same code. And it's this horrible thing. You get this massive thing. Um, you've got all these nested checks, and they, and they add up. They get in, you get more and more indentation in your code. Uh, and this is typically called the pyramid of doom. Because you're, you know, as you, if you have like three checks, it's already pretty indented. If you have 20 checks, it's going to be, you know, it's just ridiculous. You wouldn't want, this is just horrible code. You know, nobody wants code like this. And you see this all the time in other situations. Let's say we're doing with tasks and we run a, a task. Uh, and then when the task is finished, we get the value that gets output and we run the next task with that. And then when that task is finished, um, we do the next thing. And when that's finished, we do the next thing. So whether these are tasks or promises or futures, whatever you want to call them, you see this pattern a lot too. And again, it's a pyramid of doom. You have a world crossing function. You always have to check. You always have to kind of deconstruct it. Uh, you have these nested callbacks in this case, and you end up with this pyramid. So this is ugly no matter what it is. So let's see if we can solve this problem. Let's fix this. Um, there is a pattern here that we can exploit. You might see, if it's something, do something. If it's something, do something. If it's something, do something. This is the pattern. So let's turn that into a little helper function. Okay? We're going to say, if it's something, do something. And if it's not, then we do nothing. That's the pattern. So what exactly we do, we don't know what we're going to do with that thing. So let's parameterize it. We're going to say, we'll pass in a function parameter. And the function parameter will do what we want to do. We, we don't have to worry about what it is exactly. So we write a piece of, little, a piece of code like this. If something do, uh, and if, it's, if, the, if the input is optional, then we run this little helper function. And if it's not, then it's missing. So this parameter, this function parameter, is the thing that you want to do as the next step if you're valid. So once we have this little helper function, we can rewrite our original code to look like this. Do something. And if it's something, then do the next thing. And if, it's, if that one is something, then do the next thing. And if that's something, do the next thing. And this, what this little helper function does is basically clean up all that nested stuff. We now have a nice linear, vertical aligned thing. There's no indentation going on. So this is a really, really nice way of tidying up your code. I'm going to use the railway analogy. So with options, you can sort of think of there's an input, and there's two, kind of, two possible outputs. It's either something or it's nothing. And if it's something, we want to do the next thing in the chain. Uh, and if it's nothing, we want to bypass. Right? So if you actually had little bits of railway, like if you were playing with Brio or wood, wooden railway of some kind, how would you connect these things together? Well, you couldn't connect them like that, but you could connect them like that. So this is, this, is, you know, this is very close to what we want. But if we can get something like this, then we've connected them all together very nicely. So that's our goal. Now, here's the problem. If we have one track functions with one input and one output, they're easy to compose. We just connect the inputs and outputs. If we have two track functions with two inputs and two outputs, they're also easy to compose. We just wire, up, wire them up in the obvious way. But what we have is one track input and two track output. And those things cannot be composed. They just they don't fit together properly. So how can we combine mismatched functions like this? And the answer is bind. Bind all things. Functional programmers love the word bind. Um, so here we are. Here's our problem again. We've got these kind of points that, that don't compose. If we had two track functions, they would compose. Those are good. 
So how do we get from before to after? Okay. Well, we have a function adapter, a function transformer. And if you think about the, the wooden railway track, you can actually get these kind of little uh, wooden adapter blocks that you stick in, you know. So, you know, you put in this, in this adapter block, you stick in your, your uh, points function, and it comes out as a two-track function. And that's, a, like I say, it's a kind of function transformer. It functions as input and functions as output. And the implementation, it's, 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 more, it's, it's, you know, it's actually a very simple implementation. It's like literally four lines of code. It's more complicated to explain and then to actually show the code. So here's the code. An input comes in, and if it's something, we do the, the, the next function. We do the thing that you pass in. And if it's nothing, we, we, we don't do anything. So that's actually the entire implementation of bind for these kinds of points functions. So if we use it for chaining options, this is what it looks like before. If we use it for, chain, for doing, you know, we write this little bind helper function, by the way, which is exactly that little if something do function. It's exactly the same. So that if something do is actually bind, the same thing. Again, it's got this parameter that you pass in as the next thing in the chain. Uh, and then our, our code then becomes linear. So we're now using bind as the, as the word here. So no pyramids. And it's linear and clean. And if we do the same thing with tasks, when a task completes, we do the next thing in the task, and if it doesn't complete, whatever, we don't do the next thing. Same kind of pattern. We write a little task bind. So, okay, so this is the ugly version with the pyramids of doom. And we write a little task bind, which again, is, now it's a different implementation, but it has the same concept. It's like chaining tasks together. When we get the result, we want to run a function on it. Okay, there's a little, well, that's our parameterized next function. And then once we have something like this, we can then, whoops, we can then uh, connect all the, the tasks together in a linear way. We can, you know, start a task and then we can bind that to the next task and we can bind that to the next task and bind that to the next task. So this is a, this is, it's a, more, it's a general concept. It's not just specifically for options or lists or tasks. It's a concept that you can apply to almost anything, to any kind of effect. And let's look at one more example, which is error handling. <clears throat> so, here's an example of a, of a function that does some error handling. You receive a request, you validate requests, uh, you might canonicalize the email, maybe make sure, it make, make sure it's lower case. You might update the database, you might send an email to the customer or something, who knows. But this is pretty, you know, it's only five lines of code, it's pretty straightforward. But here's the problem, errors happen. Like, what happens if the request is not valid? What happens if... Uh, the customer isn't found in the database. What happens if you get a, a database exception? What happens if the SMTP server doesn't send the email? You know, all of a sudden, um, you start off with a bunch of simple code, and all of a sudden your code gets really complicated. In this case, it's three times longer, or twice as, twice as long as it was before. And this is, you know, if you've written error handling code, this, you, you see this all the time. You start off with something which, look, it starts off really simple, and it gets kind of cluttered and complicated and messy. And, it, and you lose track of what the important features are. The important stuff is, is buried in all the error handling. So let's look at the functional equivalent. We're going to define a result type, which basically is two choices. Uh, it's got a success case, an OK case, and, a, and an error case, or a failure case. And it's one of these points functions. Again, something comes in, and it can either come out as a success or come out as a failure. And then all our little validation functions basically say, you know, in this case, if, it's a, if the name is blank, um, that's an error. If the email is blank, that's an error. Uh, if the, otherwise, it's fine. And you go through all, the, all your functions in your workflow. You do exactly the same thing, and you end up with a bunch of points functions like this. Validating might, might not return an error. Updating the database might or might, might or might not return an error. Sending an email might be an error, whatever. Again, you have exactly the same situation we had before. We have these points functions, and we want to connect them together. And there we go. We're done. So that's the two-track model of error handling, otherwise known as railway-oriented programming. And I have a whole talk on that, if you're interested. So here's the, here's the code before we added error handling. Uh, let's say we don't do any error handling. We just throw exceptions. Right? So we take the request. We validate it. We do all this stuff. Um, it's nice and clean, but there's no error handling. Right? Because maybe a one track. Now, if we add the error handling in, let's see how much more complicated it makes. Okay, we're going to do lots of error handling now. Every single thing's going to be handled nicely. So afterwards, this is what it looks like. Right? It looks exactly the same. 
Now I'm cheating a little bit because I'm using this exactly the same names of the functions, but I'll probably call it validate request with error handling, and I'll close email with error handling, and update DB with error handling. You could name the functions slightly differently. But the point is that you still get this nice workflow, but behind the scenes, in the two tracks, you're handling all the errors really nicely. So this is a very, a very nice technique because it, it, keeps, it keeps the code clean. Right, so bind. You can see it's really important. The reason it's important is it makes world crossing functions composable. So let's make, now let's take bind and just make it very generic to any kind of effect that you could ever think of. Uh, it's because it's a pattern, really. It's, a, it's just a conceptual way of thinking about problems. We have these world crossing functions which starts off in normal world and it ends up in the world of effects. So this is a kind of a diagonal function. You're going diagonally from one world to another. And the problem with these things is they're not composable, right? Now what bind does is it turns it into something where the entire function lives in the world of effects. So it's a horizontal function. So you've turned a diagonal function into a horizontal function. Now these horizontal functions are great because they're easy to compose. You can literally just glue them together. So let's look at an example of that. So let's say you have a bunch of diagonal functions like this, right? You take, uh, like I say, you can't glue them together, they just don't work, it doesn't work. But if you use bind and you turn it into a horizontal function, like this, and bind again, now we have a bunch of horizontal functions and they can all be glued together. So this is why bind is so important. It's a way of chaining together diagonal functions. And diagonal functions are functions that happen all the time whenever, you, whenever effects happen. Every time you, you, know, you, you work with the IO, whether you work with a database, whether you work with options or errors or results or this or whatever, this happens a lot. So that's why bind is so nice. That's the right way to do it. So back to some terminology again. Now we know what a monad is. So a monad is an effect type of whatever kind you want to call it, like option or list or async with same, whatever, it really doesn't matter what it is. Plus a return function that turns normal values into things. Well, that's trivial, we, already, we understand how they work. And return is sometimes called pure, it's sometimes called unit, there's lots of names for it. Now here's the key thing, there's a bind function that converts the diagonal function into a horizontal function. So this is, you have these three things, and of course, um, uh, People are inconsistent with the naming, like programmers always are. Uh, some people call it bind, some people call it flat map. In Haskell, they don't even have a name for it. It's just a funny symbol with two angle brackets. Uh, in C sharp, if you use link, uh, select many is a bind operation. Um, and you have to have sensible implementations, and those are the monad laws. So when you hear something like the monad laws, you know, if you break the monad laws, you're going to go to jail. Uh, no, if you break the monad laws, it just means that your, your code doesn't work the way people would expect. Because you're not, it's, it's got a non, it, the implementation doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So that's what a monad is. A monad is, 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 is these things. It's just a, a type plus two functions plus some rules that you have to follow when you implement it. So hopefully that's, that's not so scary, maybe. Maybe monads are a little, little bit demystified. Okay, so monads are so important because you have these effect generating functions and you want to chain them in series, you need to use a monad. Now one quick thing is monads versus monoids. And um, it, this sounds like the same word. Um, they are, you can see they're actually different, but there's a, there is actually a connection because there's another way of composing these uh, points functions. Uh, you can compose two points functions and get back another points function. It's the same kind of thing. And there's the, there's the symbol for that kind of thing. Angle bracket equals angle bracket. What's interesting is if you combine these two things, you get back another thing of the same type. Does that sound familiar? So you can repeat, repeatedly add things to them. And it also turns out that the order that you combine things doesn't matter. So this looks awfully familiar. And in fact, um, if you do this, this kind of composition is in fact a monoid using points functions. Right, enough of that. One more thing, uh, and then we're talking about applicatives. So we have these effects, like we have an option of something, and another option of something, and we're going to combine them to get a pair. So let's say we have an optional 42 and an optional hello, and we combine them, and we get a pair, you know, an optional 42 and hello as a pair, as a, as a tuple, which is exactly what you expect. Now, if one of the things is nothing, 
then the overall result is nothing. Right? That's also what you'd expect. Now, what about lists? If we combine two lists and we create a pair of, it a pair of items from each list, how do we do that? Well, it turns out there's actually two different ways. One is the cross product. So if I have one, two, three, and A, B, C, I can pair each one with every other one. So one at A, and then one B, and one C, and two A, and two B, and two C, and so on. So there's nine possible answers. The other alternative is zip. When you zip two lists together, you just take them pairwise, um, the first one and the first one, one A, and two B, and three C. So there's two different ways of combining lists. The general term for combining things like this is applicative functor, another another kind of nasty word. And optional list and async are all applicatives. Pretty much everything you're going to run into can be treated as an applicative. So applicative functor, it's a horrible name, really, isn't it? Um, again, it's one of these effect types, plus a return function, plus some way of combining these two effects into one. And it's got, all, again, all sorts of names, apply, pair, different, slightly different implementations of exactly how it works. But the whole point is you're basically combining things. And again, there has to be some simple implementations, which are called the functor, applica applicative functor laws and so on. All right, why is this useful? It sounds kind of interesting, but is it actually relevant? Well, here's a, here's a really common problem. You want to validate fields in parallel. Um, let's say we have a customer, and they have to have, you know, the, the name has to be 50 characters exactly, or less than 50 characters, it can't be more. The email address has to be validated to be an at sign, the, you know, it has to be a proper birth date, which is more than 1900 and less than the current date, whatever. Often you have these validation rules. So we can create some validation functions, just like our points functions that we've done before. But when we chain them together, the problem is, if there's an error, we get the first error, and then the rest of them are bypassed. So we get one error, and all the other possible errors we never even know about. So you know that's OK, but it'd be nice if we could get all the errors at once. right? That would be nice. So what you do is, you, let's say you start off with a piece of JSON or a little you know, a DTO type where nothing is valid. The string could be anything, the email could be anything. For each field in this data structure, you run the little validation rule, and you get back some results. And then you combine the output to make a final site. And that way, you get to keep all the errors at once. That's where we want to basically run this stuff in parallel rather than in series. So how do we combine them? That's where the applicative comes in. So we have all these different values which live in result world. We have a, a result of a name. It might or might not be valid. We have a, a result of an email that might or might not be valid and a birthday that might or might not be valid. How do we combine them? Well, we know how to combine them in the normal world. If we have a, a valid name and a, a valid email and so on, we can just use the constructor to combine them. Right? We, can, we use the constructor, and we now get a valid customer. But this is working in a normal world. What's cool about applicatives is that you can turn a function that works in normal world into a function that works in result world. So you can take that constructor function and kind of lift it up into result world using the mag magic of applicatives. I'm not going to tell you how to do it because it's kind of confusing. But the point is you can take these individual things and, and make a customer. And this customer is in result world. And it's done in parallel. So if there's any errors, all the errors are combined. So if you look at the code for this, um, here's creating a valid customer in result world. We, we, we do you know, the, validate the one thing, the other thing. We get the name or an error. It's not necessarily a valid name. It could be a name or an error, right? Now, the constructor is the normal constructor. But we use these magic symbols here with the angle brackets. And we call it just like with the different parameters, just like we call the normal constructor. But we use the magic symbols instead of just normal uh, function call. Uh, and this does magic. And the output means that we get this error message. Here's the magic symbols. I'm not going to explain how they work. But the cool thing is that everything works just like you're calling a normal function. And notice that we get a list of error messages. How do we combine the list of error messages? Combining two lists to make another list? We're using monoids. So we're using applicatives and monoids in this example. All right, let's review the tools. We've got combine, which combines two values. We've got reduce, which reduces a list. Uh, we have map, which lifts functions up. We have return, which lifts individual values up. We have bind, which turns diagonal functions into horizontal functions. We have apply, which combines things in parallel. And there's other words for that. that you might see lift and so on. Right, let's look at an example. I think I'm running a little bit late. I'll just be another couple of minutes. Let's use all the tools together. 
So let's say that you need to download a URL into a JSON file, and then you need to parse that JSON into, for example, a customer DTO, and then you need to turn that DTO into a valid customer, and then you need to store that customer in a database. Okay? Now, we all, we've got these different worlds we're going to be working with. When we download the JSON file, we start off with a URL in the normal world as a string, and we actually end up in async world, uh, an async world which is on top of the result world. So when we download it, it could be a valid piece of JSON or it could be an error because the server didn't respond. And the whole thing is async because it doesn't respond straight away. So we've got an async of a result of a piece of JSON. Okay, that's our first function. The next function, we take that piece of JSON and we parse it and we decode it into the customer DTO, but that might fail because the JSON's invalid. Right, okay, so it's, it could be an error. And then we take the customer DTO and we take out the three fields and each one of these might or might not be valid. And then we take those three fields and we can make a customer. And then we take that customer in normal world and we store it in a database, which again, it might or might not store properly and it might be asynchronous. So we have all these functions and how are we going to compose them together? They're all, they're all diagonal functions, all weird shapes. They're just not going to be composed together. None of the stuff matches up. But luckily we can use our functional toolkit, which we know how to use. So the first thing is we have this parsing thing and the creating the customer. We just saw how to do that with the applicatives. So we can actually replace that with a function that turns a DTO into a customer. Okay, so we've got a DTO and a customer. Now where does the DTO come from? It comes from parsing the JSON. But when we parse the JSON, we don't get a DTO, we get a, 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 a DTO or a possible error. So it's not compatible. We have these diagonal functions. Well, how do we do that? We use binds. Okay, we do bind on these two functions and now we get some horizontal functions which we can then connect together. We compose them together into one function which now takes JSON and turns it into a customer. And then here's the code for doing that. We have a JSON or error, we bind the first thing and we bind the second thing. So literally, the code is tiny. Okay, um, the problem with this is it's still in result world. We need to move it into async world. So we use map and now it lives in async world. And then this last one, storing a customer, is again, it's a diagonal function. So we're gonna use a bind on it again to turn it horizontal, All right? And now we have the first one goes up to async world. The JSON to customer is now all in async world. The customer to storing a database is also in async world. So these are now all exactly the same types. We can glue them together and make one single function that goes all the way from one to the other. So there's an example of how you'd use these tool, uh, use to, this toolkit. So here's the code again. To download and store a custom, we start with the URL, we download the file, we take the process thing we just defined and map it up, and then we use bind on the last one to map it up. So again, just a few lines of code, um, it really takes a lot longer to explain everything than to actually write the code. You could write this code in a minute or two. You know. So, but I'm reusing the same tools, I'm using different kinds of tools, but the concepts are the same all the way through. So. Just one thing to take away, even if you don't understand everything, which I don't think you possibly can, the jargon is jargon, just like any kind of jargon, but it's not that scary. You, you know, you can, it's just unfamiliar. And hopefully you can see why functional people go on about monads all the time. Right. Now this is a very generic toolkit. They've got a set of functions like map and bind that work for anything. It's a, it's a set of patterns. This is really the equivalent of the pattern language, just like you used to strategy pattern and factory pattern and so on. This is the kind of equivalent pattern language for functional programming. So we use these kinds of functions over and over. I mean, just saw we use a whole bunch of them just for this one little example. Hopefully you can now see, when you see map and apply and bind used, you'll have some idea of what they're for. But like I say, I wouldn't expect you to understand them or it takes a while to get used to them. So there's the functional programming toolkit. Uh, I'm gonna post the slides up on my website. Um, if you're interested in this, I've got other talks. I've got a whole thing on design patterns. I've got a whole thing on composition. I've got a whole thing on domain modeling. I have a whole book on domain modeling if you're into that. Um, follow me on Twitter if you're interested. And otherwise, thanks so much for coming. Now feel free to come and ask me questions. I'll be around all day.